Okay, live is running now. Okay, Steve, are you ready with the recording? EC recording is going. Janaya? The cloud is going. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Keith, you're ready with the opening? Yes, thank you. You may begin. Well, thank you. Welcome to the remote hearing on higher education. Will council members and staff please turn on a video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Barron, we are ready to begin. Good morning and thank you. I want to thank you for joining today's virtual committee hearing from the higher education on the status of nursing programs at the City University. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud CUNY alumna. Thank you to everyone that I see here today who is ready to testify on this incredibly important and timely topic. Healthcare is one of the most rapidly expanding industries in the country. And within it, registered nurses, RNs, comprise the largest population profession. In New York City, CUNY is a major source of both new nurses to the local healthcare industry, as well as career ladder opportunities for eventually practicing registered nurses, RNs. 14 CUNY schools offer nursing degree programs with certificates and degrees, ranging from the Associate of Applied Science, AAS, in nursing, to the Doctorate in Nursing Practice, DNP. At the committee's last hearing on this topic, which was more than four years ago in 2016, the committee was interested in learning about CUNY's efforts to increase the number of nursing graduates to meet projected demand. Between the aging baby boomer generation, high rates of retire retirement among nurses, a dramatic increase in the number of people accessing healthcare with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, and an increasing reliance on nurses in the healthcare delivery system, healthcare industry experts are sounding the alarm of a looming nursing shortage crisis. At that hearing in 2016, CUNY testified about its efforts to increase the number of associates in nursing degrees, AND, bachelor's BS degrees, and master's degree program graduates with a trend toward a more highly educated nursing workforce and a goal to have 80% of all undergraduate nursing degrees be a bachelor's of science degree by 2020. Related matters were discussed at a subsequent hearing on pursuing healthcare careers at CUNY in January, 2019. Over the most recent seven year reporting period, CUNY graduated approximately 1,700 nurses in all degree levels annually. Unfortunately, this represents an overall drop with a peak of a uh, drop with a peak of 2025 degrees awarded in the 2013 to 2014 academic year. Per the American Association of College of Nursing, we do understand that while applications to nursing degree programs have been steady, a lack of faculty, clinical sites, classroom space, clinical preceptors and budget constraints have limited enrollment in nursing programs nationally. Today, as the city anticipates a second wave of the coronavirus, we must understand the full scope of CUNY's consortium of nursing programs and the challenges they face. I think it's safe to say that we all remember the sound of incessant sirens from ambulances carrying infected patients during the first wave, during the first wave, when New York, Queens to be more exact, was identified as the national epicenter of the coronavirus. 
On March 7th, Governor Andrew Cuomo issued an executive order declaring a state disaster emergency for the entire state of New York. By March 11th, the governor announced that CUNY would implement distance learning effective March 19th. Not even three weeks after the state of emergency was declared, about half of the more than 74,000 known cases in the country were in New York, which was almost 10 times more than any other state. Meanwhile, American medical experts were scrambling to study the virus, learning new indicators and better understanding its contagion factor every day. And hospitals were ill-prepared to battle the influx of highly contagious patients. In a video published by the New York Times on March 25th, an emergency room doctor exposed the overcrowded conditions and lack of PPE at Health and Hospitals Elmhurst Hospital, the so-called epicenter of the epicenter. In her video, Dr. Colleen Smith makes a plea for help, saying that the emergency department is seeing 400 plus patients a day, nearly twice the normal complement, while supplies dwindle and an increasing number of people wait for medical assessment. Doctors, nurses, and other workers at hospitals and clinics were overworked and stretched thin. Many got sick, risked the health and safety of their families and loved ones, and some died. By mid-April, for nearly a week straight, between 700 and 800 people were dying in the city every day. To meet the dire need for healthcare workers, the governor issued additional executive orders, one that allowed students in programs to become licensed in the state to practice as healthcare professionals and to volunteer at a healthcare facility for educational credit as if the student had secured a placement under a clinical affiliation agreement without entering into any such clinical affiliation agreement. And, other, and another executive order permitted graduates of registered professional nurse and licensed practical nursing licensure to qualify for educational programs registered by the state education appointment to be employed to practice nursing under the supervision of a registered professional nurse and with the endorsement of the employing hospital or nursing home for 180 days immediately following graduation. Even so, during this time, most clinical training for students in healthcare fields effectively came to a halt. In mid-May, an accelerated bachelor nursing student at CUNY's Lehman College emailed Speaker Cora Johnson lamenting the lack of an alternative to completing a clinical experience in their program. The student was eager to complete their education and apply their knowledge to join the front lines amid the pandemic. More, more recently, Lehman College announced that in June 2020, the National Commission of Collegiate Nursing Education, the CCNE, withdrew accreditation of its nursing family nurse practitioner, master of science program. That's the MSFNP. That was because the college, the Commission on Collegiate Nursing, nursing Education requires a certificate, a certification pass rate of 80% or higher in order for institutions to continue their accreditation and with a 78% pass rate for calendar year 2019 Lehman College's program was two percentage points short. The school appealed that decision, but the CCNE's board denied the appeal, leaving more than 200 registered nurses enrolled in the program unable to sit for their certification exam. As a change.org petition started by an MSFNP student, J.D. Vasquez, who I believe is here today, put it, as she put it, quote, in the year of the nurse that is an injustice, nurses risked their lives working tirelessly during the coronavirus pandemic and subsequently provided over 500 hours of additional patient care during their clinical rotations, overcoming unthinkable obstacles and making unparalleled sacrifices only to learn four weeks before graduation that it was all for a profession that they would never get to practice in. 
during that first wave, more than 4,000 so-called traveling nurses from all over the country came to New York City. And hospitals are planning to once again utilize traveling nurses. But as COVID cases spike in other cities, New York will have to compete with high demand during what healthcare experts are saying will be a very deadly winter. But from what I can tell, we have hundreds of nursing students on the brink of graduation, ready to step up and join the front lines of the pandemic in New York City. As the former epicenter of the epidemic, we don't know what the near future holds for our city. So we must first prioritize graduating our nursing students, especially when it comes to administering advanced nursing degrees for those students who worked hard to gain new skills, expand their knowledge and improve their financial standing. And we need to figure out how to get even more nurses into the pipeline. Increasing the number of nurses in New York City, especially nurses of color, increases equitable care. And just to give a little footnote historically, you may not know, so I'll share with you the fact that Harriet Tubman served as a nurse during the Civil War cases. We now know that the virus killed Black and Latino people in New York City at twice the rate that it killed white people, an incredible disparity of discrimination that reflects longstanding and persistent economic inequalities and differences in healthcare and general systemic uh, discrimination. We must do what we can to not let that happen again. And particularly in my community, there was a zip code that was designated as having the highest mortality rate in all of New York City. At today's hearing, the committee is interested in examining the full impact of the pandemic on the CUNY consortium of nursing programs. This includes learning how the programs continue to operate with the distance learning model, especially with regard to clinicals and how schools are identifying and implementing best practices. Additionally, the committee is interested in learning how CUNY is supporting nursing students and faculty at this time. Lastly, I would like to know how CUNY continues its efforts to increase nursing graduates and nursing graduates of color in particular. Before I conclude my opening statement, I would like to highlight a couple of CUNY students. The first being Irina Butcher, who graduated with her Associates in Applied Science, her AAS degree in nursing from BMCC in January, 2020. After rescheduling her appointments to take the NCLEX three times and contracting a severe case of COVID at the beginning of March, Ms. Butcher took and passed the NCLEX on April the 10th. She plans to eventually enroll in the online bachelor's degree in nursing at the School of Professional Studies. And the second highlight is Dante Krylid, a 16-year-old from Flatbush, Brooklyn Community, uh, Kingsborough Community College, the youngest graduate for the class of 2020. With a $70,000 scholarship, Mr. Kyrid, and if I'm mispronouncing your name, please forgive me, Mr. Krylid is on track to becoming a nurse practitioner and plans on majoring in nursing at Adolphi University in the fall. In preparing for this hearing, I would like to thank Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, Ms. M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation, Chloe Rivera, the committee's senior policy analyst, Michelle Peregrin, the committee's financial analyst, and Frank Perez, the committee's new community engagement representative. Um, I don't know who all of the committee members, council members are who are here, but I will announce them at another time. And I will now turn it over to senior policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call the first panel. Thank you, Chair Barron. My name is Chloe Rivera and I am the Senior Policy Analyst to the Committee on Higher Education at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you'll be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few second delay before you're unmuted and we can hear you. 
for public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Thank you. Just to interject quickly, I want to acknowledge that we do have Council Members Alan Maisel and Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. Uh, for today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the City University of New York, followed by council member questions, then public testimony. In order of speaking, we will have Patricia Semino Boyce, University Dean for Health and Human Services, Margaret Walt Riley, Academic, Nur Academic Director of Nursing Programs at the School of Professional Studies, and Anne Marie Menendez, Professor and Nursing Chair at Queensborough Community College. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond with once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Dean Boyce? I do. Thank you. Director Riley? I do. Thank you. Chair Menendez? Chair Menendez, um, a little box should pop up saying uh, to accept the unmute. It looks like she's unmuted now. Oh, I do. Um, I apologize. I do. No problem. Thank you. I will now call on Dean Boyce. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. My name is Patricia Semino Boyce and I'm the CUNY University Dean for Health and Human Services. In this role, I provide strategic direction across CUNY's portfolio of health and human service programs and collaborate with academic leadership, industry partners and key stakeholders to ensure distinction in CUNY's health professions programs and optimize clinical and field training experiences to drive career success for our students. I'm joined today by two colleagues, Dr. Margaret Riley, Academic Director of Nursing Programs at the School of Professional Studies, and Ms. Anne Marie Menendez, Professor and Nursing Chair at Queensborough Community College. Dr. Riley and Ms. Menendez will address the excellent nursing programs at their colleges and share information on the response to COVID-19. I will begin with an overview of nursing programs across CUNY and provide a brief summary of university-wide strategies to address clinical training during the COVID-19 crisis. 14 CUNY colleges offer nursing programs. Nine colleges offer an associate degree and seven offer a bachelor's degree in nursing. Four colleges offer a total of 12 master's degrees in addition to nine advanced certificates in nursing. Three colleges offer a doctorate in nursing practice and the Graduate Center offers the PhD program in nursing. CUNY graduates approximately 1,800 nurses annually from more than 50 individual degree and advanced certificate programs. On average, 700 associate degrees along with 800 baccalaureate degrees are awarded each year, in addition to approximately 300 graduate degrees and advanced certificates. CUNY nursing programs graduated a record number of 1879 students in spring 2020, the highest number in recent years. A specific point of reference is a 60% increase in nurse practitioner graduations from spring 2019 to spring 2020. This reflects the commitment of CUNY students to persevere along with innovative solutions by faculty to support student progression in our programs during the height of COVID-19 in New York City. Applications to CUNY's nursing programs remain strong. In fact, enrollment is up in our bachelor's and master's degree programs for fall 2020. Our programs conduct a blinded demographic admissions process relying on the academic qualifications of candidates to fill a limited number of available spots in each program. Similar to other nursing education <laughs> programs nationally, CUNY experiences increasing demand for our nursing programs with limitations due to admissions due to insufficient numbers of nursing faculty, clinical sites, clinical preceptors, and budget constraints. 
CUNY nursing graduates come from diverse cultural, ethnic, linguistic backgrounds. Approximately 70% of our nursing degree students are people of color, 27% Asian or Pacific Islander, 29% Black, um, non-Hispanic, and 13% Hispanic or other. This is in stark contrast to national norms where the percentage of underrepresented students enrolled in pre-licensure programs is reported at 31%. CUNY nurse practitioner graduates also represent higher than average diversity in the profession, where approximately 60% of CUNY nurse practitioner students are people of color, compared with New York City and New York State nurse practitioners reported average of 26%. CUNY is also proud of our diverse, talented, and highly experienced nursing faculty, representing a broad spectrum of clinical and research expertise. 56% of CUNY's nursing faculty is represented by people of color, which is three and a half times greater than the national average of 16%. The National Council Licensure Examination, or NCLEX, is the national licensing exam for nurses. CUNY's average NCLEX pass rate for first-time candidates has been consistently higher at 90% than city, state, and national average NCLEX first-time pass rates of 84%, 86% and 88% respectively. Similar to CUNY's ongoing programmatic changes to address external circumstances, CUNY immediately pivot to, pivoted to distance learning at the onset of COVID-19 and sought approvals from the New York State Education Department to transition to alternative training models to support students' progression in our clinical programs. CUNY's nursing program swiftly implemented a series of innovative training models, including simulated clinical learning experiences and assessment skills training, telepractice, and other virtually integrated solutions. CUNY's nursing programs worked collaboratively to identify and share access to virtual simulation platforms and other online resources, complemented by the rapid adoption of innovative methods of student engagement and assessment to ensure the quality and integrity of our successful nursing programs throughout the crisis. As a result, CUNY's nursing program sustained operations and maintained student progression, except in rare instances such as the accelerated nursing or nurse practitioner programs where the required on-site clinical hours could not be substituted due to programmatic state licensing and our national accreditation requirements. In addition, CUNY was able to offer virtually simulated learning experiences through expertise available at NYSIM, the CUNY NYU state-of-the-art high-fidelity clinical simulation center at Bellevue Hospital. The capital funds to create NYSIM were allocated by the city of New York in the wake of September 11th so that the city and its healthcare workforce would be better prepared and clearly this investment has paid off. On April 3rd, 2020, at the beginning of our transition to fully online learning, CUNY hosted a university-wide simulation summit for our health and human service programs where more than 125 faculty across campuses shared experiences on simulated learning and showcased resources and expertise available across CUNY and at NYSIM. The summit was particularly important given that the majority of our health professions program needed to transition to simulated learning experiences to substitute for clinical placements at healthcare facilities. Subsequently, CUNY's health and human service programs launched a university-wide effort to integrate virtually simulated interprofessional education, or IPE, into our professional healthcare programs using three COVID-19 case scenarios developed by multidisciplinary faculty across campuses and leveraging simulation expertise from NYSIM. These IPE learning experiences address skills training in the virtual world and prepare students for the evolving practice of healthcare and increasing use of telepractice in response to COVID-19. In addition, these virtual IPE experiences are being used by several programs to replace and or complement limited access to clinical practice settings during the pandemic and provide meaningful clinical experiences for students while demonstrating the importance of teamwork and collaboration. We recognize the extraordinary efforts our faculty have undertaken to ensure the quality of, ed of educational and clinical training experiences to prepare health profession students during the COVID-19 crisis. CUNY is proudly maintaining the integrity of our health professions programs through innovative training models to prepare highly trained and eminently qualified professional professionals for an evolving healthcare landscape. In summary, CUNY nursing programs provide aspiring students with a road to the middle class 
through employment in, highly, in a highly respected profession, along with opportunities for continued lifelong learning for professional success. The high value of CUNY nursing programs is expressed by local healthcare partners who seek out CUNY nursing graduates due to the quality of our programs and the successful professional practice networks of CUNY nursing graduates across New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to present to the committee. Thank you. Now, Director Riley, you may begin once a member of our staff unmutes you and the sergeant gives you the cue. You may begin. Chair Barron and council members, thank you for this opportunity to present an example of CUNY's approach to nursing, specifically the CUNY School of Professional Studies. The CUNY School of Professional Studies provides online, classroom-based, and customized programs of study that are responsive to the needs of our students and our city, focusing on forms of teaching, learning, and scholarship that highlight innovation, personal and social progress, and opportunities for careers and service. CUNY SPS, grounded in CUNY's tradition of access and academic excellence, is dedicated to serving as the university's premier school for adult learners. Adapting to the needs of our students across a growing range of fields and sectors, we expand CUNY's ability to address the demands of evolving workplaces and disciplines. CUNY SPS holds to the core values of responsiveness and quality. And as the university's leader in online learning, it is ranked in the top 5% in the US News and World Report's best online bachelor's degree programs for 2020, marking the sixth year in a row that the school has been highly ranked by the publisher. The school's growth has been remarkable with 23 degrees launched since 2006. Enrollment has risen by more than 30% in the last four years to over 4,000 students in the credit bearing programs and thousands more who are enrolled in non-degree and grant funded workforce development programs. Earlier this fall, CUNY SPS was selected to receive the 2020 Online Learning Consortium Effective Practice Award. The honor was granted for our entry, a three-pronged approach to online orientation for adult learners, which described how the three CUNY SPS online orientation programs effectively helped adult online learners be successful in their courses, which are based on the model of deliberately and mindfully building a community. As the premier CUNY School of Online Learning, SPS was asked to develop and provide online teaching essentials workshops this summer and fall to help faculty across the CUNY system learn about best practices in online instruction and to convert their summer and fall courses to fully online courses in the wake of the COVID pandemic. This initiative aimed to ensure that tens of thousands of students across CUNY whose lives may have otherwise been disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic could continue to receive high quality academic instruction. And in recognition of this service, SPS received the 2020 University Association for Professional Continuing and Online Education Mid-Atlantic Region Award for Faculty Development. The CUNY SPS online nursing program was launched in 2014 in response to the need to expand opportunities for associate degree nurses to progress to the BS in nursing. This is critically important now more than ever with the BS in 10 legislative requirement for registered nurses in New York State to complete their bachelor's degree in nursing within 10 years of licensure. Our programs help nurses advance within their careers while continuing their education in a timely, flexible, and affordable way. From our first cohort of 45 undergraduate students, the SPS undergraduate nursing program is currently the largest RN to BS nursing program in CUNY, comprised of over 600 undergraduate students. In addition, our nearly 200 graduate students include those enrolled in the only nursing informatics graduate program in CUNY. 
The nursing informatics program is a master's and credit bearing certificate program that focuses on integrating and analyzing health information and technology to inform healthcare practice, advance health outcomes, and facilitate research and education. Just over 70% of our students are graduates of CUNY Community College programs, and 95% reside in New York State. As per our 2019-2020 data, our diversity is reflective of the New York City community. Asian or Pacific Islander, 25%, Black non-Hispanic, 29%, Hispanic other, 17%, White, Caucasian, 28%. Our faculty is also reflective of diversity and inclusivity in race, ethnicity, and are representative of the LGBTQ and disabilities populations. As a testament to the quality of the education, our programs were reaccredited by the National Body of the Collegiate Commission on Nursing Education last September. Unique to our school, we offer full tuition scholarships after one semester at SPS to graduates of CUNY Community College nursing programs funded by the Petrie Foundation. And most recently, we secured funding from the Robin Hood Foundation to offer a career ladder scholarship for minority men in nursing and healthcare services. We have created innovative dual joint degree programs with four CUNY Community College nursing programs, including Borough of Manhattan, Bronx, LaGuardia and Queensboro Community Colleges with the mission to streamline and seamlessly advance associate degree nurses to a bachelor degree to meet the Institute of Medicine goal of 80% of RNs with a BS. In the six short years that SPS nursing programs have been in existence, we have graduated over 500 RN to BS students, contributing to the local healthcare workforce and enhancing quality care for diverse populations. Our students are the backbone of New York City health and hospitals and other healthcare systems, and are poised to engage and excel in leadership in education, population health, data-driven decision-making, and advocacy for quality care. Our students have heroically served in hurricane and earthquake-ravaged communities, the COVID-19 epicenters of New York City, and most recently, one of our students will use her advocacy skills as a newly elected member of the New York State Assembly. In early March, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, all student clinical experiences at healthcare sites were abruptly canceled by the facilities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. SPS Nursing partnered with over 22 community partners across New York City and engaged our students with community dwelling seniors to provide telehealth wellness services. In addition, we collaborated with an effort from the Office of the CUNY Dean of Health and Human Services to participate in interprofessional education simulation experiences with 14 other disciplines in health and human services in CUNY. These and other innovative responses ensured that our students acquired the skills needed to advance and contribute to their professional practice. CUNY SPS will continue to be flexible and responsive to the needs of our community of nurses by introducing new opportunities that expand the possibility and promise of public education and position our students to grow personally, excel in the workplace, and enrich their communities. Thank you for this opportunity to present to the committee. Thank you for your testimony. Chair Menendez, you may begin once you are unmuted. <laughs> Chair Menendez, sorry, I think you, uh, Reclicks mute. Try one, one more time. How's that? I'm having. Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Barron and Council members. Queensborough Community College is one of the best two year colleges in the nation. With one of the most diverse student bodies in the United States, Queensborough has been acclaimed by higher education public 
examples, including the Chronicle of Higher Education as a top degree producer and one that provides its students with many opportunities for stability into the middle class. Established in 1967, the nursing program at Queensboro continues its outstanding reputation for highly skilled caring nurses. Our nurses graduating, our nurses, our nursing graduates continue their studies at four-year colleges or degrees, and many enter the workforce while pursuing their bachelor's degree in nursing. Because our standards are high, our students' accomplishments are impressive. With the national passing rate for the NCLEX RN associate degree exam at 84%, we are especially proud that Queensboro's passing rate for 2018 is 95%. Approximately 80% of Queensboro graduates secure employment in their first year, giving back to their at public, private or university hospitals and other facilities, often within the five boroughs. In fact, nine out of 10 graduates live in New York and contribute to the national and local economies. Graduates earn a medium income of 70,000, propelling them as quintile of earners to the middle class. Queensboro nursing students are twice as diverse in terms of gender and ethnicity than nursing stations na nationwide. 20% of Queensboro nursing students identify as male compared to a national proportion of just 10%. 60% of our nursing students are first generation college students. In the healthcare industry, diversity is critical for patient health and well. communication, for example, is more effective when healthcare providers are able to build trust, manage language barriers, bridge cultural gaps, undisparate value systems, and respond to the needs of different patient populations. It is also important that our students see themselves in their faculty. Six of Queensboro's 26 full-time nursing faculty members are Black or African American, three are Asian or Pacific Islander, and three are male. Our faculty's wide scope of professional and teaching experience advanced environment, enhancing each student's ability to prepare for a career in nursing. The college's strong mentorship program provides support, advisement, encouragement, and strategies for via workshops and peer mentoring. And senior students are presented with opportunities to enhance their leadership and communication skills. Queensboro offers three dual joint programs with Hunter Bellevue School of Nursing, CUNY School of Professional Study, and York College. These programs full and part-time students to progress seamlessly to a bachelor's degree at local CUNY senior colleges. Queensboro students apply for these programs enrolled in their first clinical course at Queensboro. Early this year, in consideration of our high standards and accomplishment, the accreditation Education and Nursing, ASIN, granted Queensboro eight years of reaccreditation. In mid-March, due to safety concerns, we received from the New York State Department of Education Office of Profession to transition students and faculty from the clinical and classroom settings to an online modality. Within days, CUNY's Dean for Health and Human Services, um, Dr. Boyce, provided monetary and pedagogical support to pivot to an online form for both the clinical and classroom component. Faculty worked tirelessly to share best practices to ensure that students continue to receive the best education under these challenging circumstances. The nursing program recruits the majority of its students, faculty and staff from Queens and the New York City area. The program of study posted on our website is continuously updated to provide access to all prospective applicants. We regularly place articles, cultural and foreign language publications to highlight our nursing students and alumni's ability to excel in the nursing profession. Admission is offered the spring and fall semesters with an evening session available to accommodate working students. Nurses represent some of the most trusted and admired in our community honesty, responsibility, and the pursuit of new knowledge. It demands a lifelong commitment to learning and a passion and ability to pursue this calling. Queensboro Community College is privileged to champion these values and respond to the challenging healthcare needs of patients of all ages.
Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that they have a question for this panel. Chair Barron. Chair Barron, you are uh, on mute. Am I unmuted now? Yes, and also, uh, Please watch out for your papers on the microphone. Okay, thank you. thank you. I haven't yet mastered how to have my text on the screen and be able to look at myself and make sure everything is right and hear everything, but I'm working on that. But I do have the testimony on my screen now. And I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you all for your testimony. And I'm particularly, I'm proud of CUNY and the work that they've done overall but I'm particularly focused in this hearing uh, on how we're going to help students graduate. And I'm particularly concerned that the uh, Lehman program has lost its accreditation. So in your testimony, you say that normally uh, CUNY's average NCLEX pass rate for first time candidates has consistently, has been consistently higher at 90% than city, state, and national average NCLEX first time passing rates of 84, 86, and 88 respectively. What happened at Lehman? How is that impacting the students, particularly in light of your testimony about BS in 10? Uh, and for those students who might in fact be restricted by that. So I'm really gonna focus, I appreciate all your testimony. I'm really focusing on what we need to do and whether or not students or schools have submitted plans to SED that are alternatives to the um, requirements that work in hospitals. Thank you, Chair Barron. Um, in response to your question, the um, NCLEX rates cited in the testimony refer to our pre-license programs. Just to clarify that the Lehman program is a master's program, so that's different. And the Lehman um, certification exam is to uh, practice as a nurse practitioner, which is an advanced practice license and scope of practice. So, so just- the Lehman program is an advanced program. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what do students get at the end of that completion? They get a master's degree in family nurse practitioner. And if they sit for the national certifying exam, then they're certified to serve as a nurse practitioner and their license with New York State is amended to reflect their scope of practice or practitioner um, as a nurse practitioner. So for those students, uh, so the, the, the uh, notice came at some point during this school year that Lehman had lost its um, accreditation in that part, in that field. And students had already been engaged in preparation for the exam, thinking that they would take it, I believe in June. They, the exam is given at multiple points during the year. So students schedule the exam prior to graduation and typically align the exam date when they with the fulfillment of their graduation requirements. So now that these, now that, that accreditation has been lost at Lehman, I don't know. Uh, my question is what happens to those students who now cannot take it? Can they transfer to another school and do it through another school? What, what options are there for them to be able to get this degree, Pat, take the exam and get the certification and the license um, amended. Sure. So what we are doing right now is we appeal to CCNE to ask for a request, or I'm sorry, an extension for the withdrawal decision, at least to complete the pending graduates' um, qualifications to sit for the exam. And uh, we are we understand that that request has gone to the executive committee of the Board of Commissioners for CCNE, and we're hoping to receive a response to that request within the next week. Secondly, we've also um, submitted a request to the second certifying body that allows um, nurses to sit for the certifying exam, and that is the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners Cert Certification Board, AANPCB, and they are now reviewing our request to use our other certification, which is the New York State Education Department certification. Um, New York State, um, if you're not aware, is a national certifier 
for um, nursing programs around the state. So we do have national certification through the New York State Education Department. So if we, we've requested the opportunity to use that certification to sit and qualify for the second certifying exam. So we understand that both of those um, groups are weighing our decision and we're hoping to hear very shortly. If that's the case, then our students will be permitted to sit for the exam and proceed with graduation as planned. And there would not be any distinction between uh, this process and the regular NCLEX process. There'd be no distinction, you know, it's not. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Just so you know, NCLEX is for pre-licensure. This that's for RNs. This is for the certification for nurse practitioners, which is different. It's advanced practice, and we're talking yes, about two I, different I, certifying I, boards. I know there's a lot of acronyms in here and different things. So there's two different certifying boards, and we're applying to both of them to provide permission to our students to sit for those national certifying exams. Okay, and so there would be no distinction uh, in the if they're using the alternative route. No. No, we've already confirmed, no. Okay, all right, very good. And do you have any idea about when that would happen? Yes, as, as I mentioned, we are waiting for a response. We expect a response from both of those organizations within the next week. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Riley, you talked about uh, School of Professional Studies having extensive online offerings as well as the classroom offerings and that you were used to conduct training for other faculty and staff. Are all of your classes available online? Are all of your offerings that are in person also available online? Or is there a limited menu of course offerings online? From the school perspective, uh, the majority of our programs are fully online. We do have a limited number of programs that were in person and have had to pivot to the online format uh, due to this pandemic. All of our nursing courses, all of our nursing programs are, are fully online. All nursing are fully online, okay. So someone can complete this all online and not have to appear in person for your nursing programs. That is correct. There are clinical requirements for the program as there are for all our NTBS programs. Those clinical requirements did require in-person interaction and those could be done at local um, clinics, local hospitals where the students work. We also assist our students in placement. Due to the nature of what happened with the pandemic through the offices of the Dean of Health and Human Services, Dr. Patty Boyce, all of the CUNY nursing programs collectively filed an application to the state education department to request permission to conduct alternate clinical experiences for our students to ensure that they met the program and the course objectives. And that was approved through the efforts of Dr. Boyce's office so that we were collectively in one mass in one group petitioning the state to be able to do this. All of the programs were granted this permission in the spring and our application, I'm sorry, we were granted the permission in the spring to run these clinicals in the fall. And we are currently have requests into the state education department to ask permission to extend the opportunity for alternate clinical experiences for the spring in anticipation of many facilities closing down once again to student access. So is it, is it accurate to say then that all nursing students who need to have their clinical hours uh, have, will have an opportunity to do so via these alternative um, clinical experiences that you're offering? Will all students have that opportunity to access these uh, alternate methods so that they can satisfy their clinical hours? Yes, once they are approved by the state education department, they will be allowed to use these alternate clinical experiences that the nursing programs have designed collaboratively uh, with assistance from Dr. Boyce's office to be able to offer those hours for those students so they can fulfill their requirements and not delay their progression and graduation. 
Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that, but it sort of conflicts with what students had said was actually their experiences during uh, the last uh, five, six months. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the students' testimony so that we can get clarity and make sure that they themselves are aware of what the opportunities are because it's been somewhat uh, different from what's being presented here. And I remember earlier on, uh, actually perhaps it was in June, I spoke with someone who did not know that there were alternative measures that were being uh, offered for consideration and approval. So I'm glad to know that and we'll make sure that. So how is this information relayed to all of the students that are in fact in the programs and need to move forward? I can speak for how I conducted it for my program. Uh, being that we are an online program, our primary mode of communication is through email, through posting in course sites so that students have access to the information. Uh, we had a coordinated effort to inform the students, to make them aware, um, and then we set those processes up. So all of the students that were interested in participating in the clinical experience at our program were able to take advantage of this. And, and Chair Barron, if I may, yeah. I just want to clarify okay. one point, which is that um, in most cases, the clinical hours are able to be substituted, but if not in all cases. So in some cases, the accreditor does not permit a substitution of an alternative. So for example, the nurse practitioner accreditors do not really allow substitution of clinical hours because they think that's critical to the successful preparation of nurse practitioners. In other cases, we have accelerated programs, which are much more tight timeframes in terms of students completing those clinical experiences. And there's often not an opportunity to substitute what we consider a very limited but required number of clinical hours for those students to be proficient and prepared to successfully practice. So in most cases, the alternatives are very successful and have met most of our needs, but in some cases we're prevented due to other program accreditation or licensing requirements. What can we do for those persons who've dedicated years perhaps? Yes, absolutely. We're not, we're actually supporting all those students. If their clinical hours for some reason, as I've explained, had been delayed, they are being put into clinical hours immediately when those sites are open and available to them. Our campuses by and large have been working very, very hard with all of our clinical partners. We collectively, I speak with health systems across the city on a regular basis. So when those health systems allow us to get in, for any of our clinical placements when they feel it's safe and, and they can meet the safety of their patients, their staff, and certainly our students, then we take advantage of those opportunities. So at most, the only um, um, suggestion is that we can delay that, but all of those students will get those clinical requirements met at some point. How many students have been able uh, as these openings have occurred and what are the circumstances under which uh, a healthcare facility will say, okay, we can provide these clinical hours. It changes based on the nature of the pandemic and the other situations, the operational issues and other constraints by the health system. So we've been very responsive. Some of our campuses based <clears throat> on what solutions and arrangements they have with their sites have made some accommodations, but it's completely at the will and at the discretion of the clinical site. It's not up to us. When it's allowable, we have permitted our students to go on site. Our primary objective is to maintain operation and progression of our students in these programs. And for the most part, we have done this very successfully. The only problem we've had or actually alternative is actually just delaying some students progression when those sites won't let us in. But as soon as the sites let us in, we go immediately and fulfill those students clinical hours. So it's really not been a matter of not doing everything on our end. It's actually just a matter of um, the sites allowing us access. Uh, thank you. I want to uh, acknowledge you. We have been joined by Majority Leader Lori Combo, and I know you have a hard stop for your presentation, so I'm trying to thank you. Uh, get all of my questions in. I thank you for your presence and your presentation. What can we do? We're creative people. I mean, we have to be able to find a way, and I, I ask you the question because you're the professional in the field and you understand what it takes. We're not in any way 
talking about um, lowering the standards of what it takes to be a nurse because no one wants to have a healthcare per provider uh, uh, responding to them who has not been fully prepared. So we're certainly not talking about cutting corners in that regard. What can we do? What are some of the out of the box thinking that we can uh, propose and, and perhaps um, test in a pilot project to see how that works? Well, thank you for asking. I think we've already tried and are implementing a number of innovative solutions. As Dr. Riley outlined, we are using simulation. As Ms. Menendez presented, we have introduced a number of alternative training models. We are working with our clinical partners. If they let us in uh, lesser um, numbers of students on fewer days, we work with them and we take what we can work with, it, with, work with, with that and extend our programming. In almost all cases, our campuses have re-engineered our curriculum to make sure that we're allowing for the most valuable clinical experiences in any way that we can offer them. We continue to educate and provide opportunities to support our programs. As Dr. Riley mentioned, we've initiated interprofessional ed educational opportunities across our campuses. So we have 14 campuses engaged in IPE right now, which is a tremendous learning experience for our students. That's all virtually simulated. So we are implementing things that would have taken many, many years, I think, to get off the ground very quickly, but they are serving as very suitable, if not optimal alternatives for our students at this time. And we have looked in, and used every national evidence-based resource in terms of virtual simulation, virtual and online programming, and also other case studies that support the clinical experiences, the critical judgment, and the clinical learning needs of our students through this scenario. So we continue to evolve and um, test and apply every evidence-based and alternative model that we've identified. We remain open and actually appreciate the support of the council as well as all of our clinical partners who have worked very closely with us to provide access any and wherever they can. <coughs> And we continue to work with our partners. We work very closely with New York City Health and Hospitals and other partners to provide access or alternatives for placements that might have been less traditional in the past, but where we're turning to them as very good alternatives. Again, striking the right balance of making sure, as you said, that our students are getting the proper education, are prepared for their clinical practice, not cutting any corners, but being innovative in every way we can. What would you say is the impact of COVID uh, on, on the number of students who will be able to, how has the number of students, how do you project the number of students will be decreased to be able to complete their requirements and sit for their tests and, and actually achieve what it is that they had set for their goals? So in most cases, we are able to maintain our progression of students in almost all cases. Um, there's very few instances where students are not graduated on their scheduled graduation day, but may have had to defer a graduation. Again, that's very few instances. In some cases, we actually um, had early graduations for some of our programs in the spring of our final year students to advance um, the governor's initiative to try to get folks into practice as soon as we can. So we've met or exceeded all of the expectations in terms of student progression. And at this point, as I mentioned in testimony, the admission, the enrollment in our bachelor's and master's program is up in fall of 2020, which makes us very happy. As I mentioned also, we had the highest number of graduations in spring 2020 at the height of the pandemic, which I think again demonstrates the perseverance of our students and our ability to maintain their progression in our programs. I don't know if I can uh, quantitatively project what the impact will be on COVID. I think what COVID is doing to the practice of education, certainly nursing, is very quickly evolving it to alternative um, means of delivery, obviously telepractice, telehealth, and also challenging us to use these new technologies in a way that's going to better prepare our students for this evolving landscape. Uh, thank you. I have a few other questions that I'd like to pose and I'll get them in quickly. Uh, I'm recognizing your time and you may be the person that would have to uh, answer these questions. What is the number of part-time versus full-time students who are currently enrolled in your nursing programs? 
don't have a number uh, specifically on that right at hand, but I'm happy to get back to you on that. Okay, and if you could, I would like to have that disaggregated by degree type, as well as race, race ethnicity, and gender where noted. Um, yes. How many students that are currently enrolled as nursing students are also working at the same time as nurses? I don't have that data quantitatively, but anecdotally, I think it's a very high number. And just so you're aware, even students in our pre-licensure programs are employed in many aspects of the healthcare system. So they may be working as nursing aides, nursing assistants, um, unit secretaries, um, medical assistants. So many of our students um, are actually working their way through school in many ancillary jobs in the healthcare industry. Okay, but if you could give me all of that data uh, subsequently. I'm not sure how much data we actually collect on how many of our students are also act actively employed, but I'm happy to share with you what we were able to collect. Okay, good. Uh, regarding enrollment, uh, what efforts does CUNY make to recruit a diverse pool of students in their nursing programs? Do you have affiliations with high schools or other entities that would attract? And I did hear you talk about a program that was funded, I think you said, by the Robin Hood Foundation, which is attracting uh, men and offering scholarships. I'd like to hear about that as well. That's Dr. My, uh, Riley's program. I'm happy to defer to her for that. But in general, we do have relationships with several high schools and other um, pipelines for our nursing programs. So for example, the Hero High School in the Bronx, which is health education and research occupations. We have direct relationship with students that come from there through host, with, through hostos and then pursue a number of nursing, <clears throat> excuse me, and other allied health uh, profession careers. We also have uh, programs called College Now, which actually engages with many high schools across the city to, again, create pipelines and tracks for healthcare and health education uh, programming. And we actually work very closely with our partners at the community level to really create um, as much awareness building and support and really support a lot of our entry into our associate as well as bachelor's degree programs through those channels. I had also put in a, a, an appeal <laughs> You uh, look to, I'll talk to the principal also at one of the campus schools at located at Thomas Jefferson campus. They also have a, a health program there and I'd love for them to be able to have a direct connection to that outreach. Thank you. Um, I did hear you talk about uh, the other program and the program which you said offered scholarships. We're always talking about that. We know that student loan debt is uh, crisis levels and we need to address how we can have that. But you, I believe I heard you say that there's a full tuition scholarship after one year and, and there's another program that has an actual appeal to uh, having minority men participate. And you, I think you said I it would- I refer to my colleague, Dr. Riley for that response. Okay, Dr. Riley. <laughs> So I'm happy to respond to that. Those are um, scholarships and funds that are unique to the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Uh, we, we solicited funding from the Petrie Foundation. And over the last three years, we were able to fund a number of uh, nursing students that graduated from our CUNY Community College. That was one of the stipulations of the degree of the, of the funding. Uh, students who uh, were interested in applying for this uh, submitted an application. We had a, a review committee uh, evaluate uh, the students that submitted their applications. And based on the funds we were allocated, we were able to fund about 30 students for this full tuition scholarship that uh, sustained them through the remainder of their period of time earning their degree at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. The Career Ladders uh, Scholarship is a new initiative. Again, we secured grant funding from the Robin Hood Foundation, um, and it is targeted to recruit minority men into not just nursing, but also the other health services administration and health information management program that we have at our school. Um, and we are recruiting and uh, going to our CUNY community colleges to start. Uh, but we have a we've hired a full time uh, advisor that will also be developing a recruitment plan to be able to uh, identify students who would be interested and eligible to, to participate in this initiative. So this is something that's new and unfolding and what would be uh, the um, 
supports that students who qualify would be able to expect from the program? So the students would get a limited amount of uh, money for uh, applying to their tuition as well as textbooks. Um, they would also have a dedicated advisor that would work with them as they transition through the program. Um, programs would be alerted as to which students are uh, qualified or uh, receiving this so that we could also ensure that the academic plan that's developed for them is appropriate to help them move and progress through the program. And how many students do you anticipate will be a part of that program? I, I don't have that numbers for you right now, Chair Barron, but happy to provide that to Dean Boyce, who will also be the funnel for getting information back to you that you are requesting. Okay, thank you. Um, now, you talked about the um, BS in, 20, in 10. When was that implemented? How long has that been in place? And are students aware of these time restrictions on that program? Yes, the legislation was signed in December of 2017. It was intended to go into effect 18 months after, which was May of 2019. Anyone that was enrolled in a program or graduated a program at the time that it was signed into legislation were grandfathered in. So as of May 9, 2019, our graduates actually need to complete a bachelor's in nursing within 10 years of graduation. And we do have very active and ongoing communications across our campuses on that information. All of our associate degree campuses have what we call dual or joint degree uh, pathways with our senior campuses so that we are able to enroll our students if interested in any of our seven BS to R, I'm sorry, RN to BS completion programs. So we do take that very seriously at CUNY and create the pathways and bridges to make that possible for our students. Okay, in June 25th of this year, the chancellor issued a revised guidance for students seeking admission to CUNY's nursing programs, consistent with the regulations of the New York State Education Department that make professional licensure available, not only to US citizens, but to non-citizens so long as they quote, not unlawfully present are present in the United States, including those, uh, with DACA arrivals and those who are permanently residing in the United States <clears throat> under the color of law, pro cool. When, when did the New York State Education Department in, institute the regulation? It appears that it was June 1st, 2016. And if so, why did it take CUNY over four years to revise its guidance as to not to preclude an otherwise qualified applicant from obtaining a professional license certificate, limited permit or registration? Sure, I, I arrived at CUNY at late summer of 2019. My understanding prior to my arrival is that this particular policy was under review in quite extensive ways, going through a number of different considerations with the new administration and different immigration changes, and also doing everything we could to make sure that we were responsive to both the mission of CUNY and the intent of the legislation in terms of admitting students. Um, upon my arrival, I worked closely with our campuses as well as the um, Office of General Counsel at CUNY and our other immigration specials to make sure that we would be able to put something together and, and certainly advance the policy in a way that was reflective of the state legislation. So we were very happy to release this policy, expand the opportunity for admissions to immigrant students and support what really is CUNY's mission about access. Uh, so in, a, in accordance with the revised guidance, mm -hmm. the new nursing admission eligibility requirements apply to individuals to be admitted or advanced into a nursing program in the fall of 2020 mm -hmm. and beyond. And the quote, updated policy does not affect students who have advanced into the clinical component of CUNY's nursing program or others considered for advancement prior to summer 2020. So why is this program not retroactive? And can you estimate how many potential nursing students or graduates missed out over the past four years? 
I'm sorry, I can't, I can't provide any numbers on that, but I'm happy to go back and see what we have on it. And in general, what we were trying to do, the intent of the policy was to create a starting point for admission so that all admissions would be considered using the new policy to be as inclusive as possible. So how is CUNY making this change known to students? How are you getting the word out that this is happening? The expectation and in, in, in that policy was the directive to all programs to make sure that this was made clear in nursing handbooks and all admission materials online and in writing so that every student interested in applying to a nursing program would understand the policy. So would students perhaps uh, now having an increased number of students perhaps applying for this program and with your testimony that there's been a steady, uh, steady number of students applying for enrollment how are we going to um, address this increased population? We you have indicated that the faculty numbers really don't address or match what we need to, in terms of addressing the students' uh, course offerings. So right. what can we do? So I think what we would most appreciate is uh, budget support and any funding support to be able to expand our programs. Our programs are, are, are quite highly regarded. The admission rate, um, the, certainly the admission interest <laughs> continues to go up. Again, we're only restrained by our budget that limits us around faculty um, hirings. And also what, high, what also is a limitation to us is our clinical placements and preceptor availability. So those are the two areas where we're actually always struggling to try to increase our admissions and they remain somewhat fixed. Um, clinical placement sites continue to be a challenge across all nursing programs within CUNY and outside of CUNY. So we do work creatively with our partners. I'm working with a number of partners now to extend our clinical placements into new and expanded units at their health facilities. I'm also working on creating what we call nurse externships or career readiness opportunities for our students prior to graduation. So we continue to explore a number of opportunities, but those become relatively fixed external issues that limit our ability to increase admissions. And I see the clock is moving on. So just uh, one or two more questions. Kurt how many faculty members instruct aspiring nurses in CUNY's nursing program and how many are tenured, how many are adjunct? And is that, um, is that appeal, is their salary appealing enough for them to be attracted to become a faculty person? Or are they perhaps more attracted to actually being in the field, doing the work of a nurse and perhaps getting a, a larger salary? I can get back to you on the number you requested on tenure and adjunct versus part-time, full-time faculty. But your, your question about attracting nurses to the field, we have a number of pathways to do that. We've increased our master's programs. So that creates opportunities for additional uh, practice and um, opportunities for nurses in the field to engage with us on that. We also engage a number of different um, clinical lecturers as well as clinical adjunct faculty and hope to um, engage them in faculty appointments over time. We have um, strong relationships between our current nursing faculty and their colleagues at many of our health system partners. And that continues to maintain opportunities for us for placements as well as recruitment of faculty. And we do have our PhD program and many of our nursing faculty go through that PhD program and continue to pursue tenured faculty lines. So that creates a pipeline for us as well. Great. Uh, you, you have a, about two minutes. And I do want to recognize that Council Member Rodriguez has his hand raised. Mm -hmm. And that might be a question that he might want to address to you. So Council Member Rodriguez, you have to be brief and to the point with your question. Thank you. If the host could acknowledge Council Member Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez, do you see the unmute box? Um, Councilmember Rodriguez, are you are you ready for your question? Our uh, one of our panelists has to leave in about two minutes. There we go. Yeah, but we, we should have enough time to ask a question, uh, Chairman. 
Yes, you can ask your question. Go right ahead. This question is having a CUNY to establish what used to be the Sophie David, now the formal CUNY and coordinate everything related to the skill of health, including nurses. I apologize, the sound quality was not very clear on my end. If you can possibly repeat that question. Having Sophie David now turning to be the CUNY School of Medicine, does it make sense that CUNY was central in program and be centralized by, by the new formal CUNY School of Medicine? Just to clarify, I hear you're asking a question about the CUNY School of Medicine. I'm not understanding the part of what you're asking about, about centralizing something at CUNY. Your transmission is about the body, council member. Since that now that we have the, what is the term? Can you hear me? Councilmember Rodriguez. I said you, you're trying. It seems you have a bad signal. Let me, we okay, can't. Let, let me, re, can you hear me now? Can you hear me better now? It's in and out. Let me let me try, let me go back. Let me reconnect it in. Okay, uh, he'll call back in. Um, but just generally, um, I do want to uh, excuse you from your presentation on this panel. I want to respect your time as well. And the other members will be remaining. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate your consideration, and we're happy to get back to you with any information you request. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I do have more questions. Um, how does CUNY work to attract, attract distinguished faculty uh, who are able to make more money working as a nurse uh, than perhaps being on faculty? How can we address that? And it was a question that was uh, partially addressed by Dean Boyce in her presentation. I can try to address that, Chair Barron. Uh, in general, uh, pay in the uh, clinical and healthcare settings is significantly greater uh, than the scale of pay that faculty receive uh, working in an academic setting. Uh, there are uh, some initiatives that have been uh, promoted to attract faculty, uh, and that is usually done by appealing to faculty from other academic settings, advertising and recruiting for unique programs and positions um, that are hosted at particular schools. Uh, that is usually done at a point of hire when uh, a faculty line becomes available or uh, a dean or director or chairpersonship becomes available. Those efforts are made. In general, advertising for faculty is done in academic journals as well as in uh, a series of um, well-respected and uh, typical areas where faculty would look for positions. Uh, we also appeal to uh, faculty that are working in clinical roles, um, of which there are many uh, with whom we engage and many who then choose to pursue further academic degrees, uh, and those are also uh, people that we uh, reach out to in an effort to engage with them and have them participate in our academic uh, endeavors with our students. Uh, it is truly a partnership. Um, we do have full-time faculty working in our settings, but we also uh, rely on and require um, the partnership and collaboration of our many, many clinical faculty who work with us as adjuncts and who bring a skill set 
uh, practice in the real world, in the real clinical setting that is invaluable. So uh, we look at it as a partnership as well. At Queensboro, we actually have um, five of our full-time faculty um, started out at Queensboro and got their education here and went on and feel very committed to our program and have come back now as faculty. And so what type of supports do you offer for students, particularly during this time of the pandemic? Uh, what kinds of support, academic support, financial support, um, mental support? We know that there's a great push on this great stress that they're enduring. So what types of support are you offering to your students? at? I, I can speak at Queensboro um, under the new leadership of our new president, um, Dr. Mangino, we have a, a large food bank and we moved it to a central location um, to make it more available and to widely advertise it to students. Um, proud of that. We have an extensive online counseling department and I've made sure to all our nursing students that that link has been sent to them where they can actually have virtual. Um, we have an extensive mentorship, um, mentorship program at Queensboro, which is funded by the Petrie Foundation. Um, so students have been getting, um, Queensboro was very generous in providing um, a substantial PPE, which I started ordering early in May. Um, so we'd have it available for our faculty and students that were able to go back into the clinical this fall. Um, in addition, Queensboro has been very generous because it was online and the, the issue that we found was that a lot of students did not have the proper laptops or computers. So Queensboro was very generous. Um, we actually, all the, the statistics and the, um, um, the settings and the programs that they needed specifically to be successful. And a number of our nursing students received, which you mailed to their homes um, so they could um, succeed or continue in the program. Our faculty, um, you know, with our online faculty actually meet with the students, even though um, in March, we had to go online. Faculty would meet with the students at a regular day. Um, they didn't just you know, let them go by themselves. They actually sat with them, they met with them, they reflected. Um, so I, I think we've given a lot of support since, um, you know, since the pandemic has hit, but we do understand that it has been very, very challenging. And in terms of students who might have special needs, uh, students that are some kind of well we do um yeah at, at Queensboro we, we have um differently yes we do provide I'm sorry okay. uh, you're, oh, so you're asking for students with special needs we do have a right. students um a disabilities office and we do encourage nursing students who might need specializations to um, seek out the um, help in that office. And we do provide uh, special accommodations for our nursing students. Okay. Oh, okay. I believe that uh, Council Member Rodriguez is back on. So I will uh, allow him to pose his questions at this time. So if the host is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chair. Thank you, Chair. And so my question was, since we have a, what used to be the Sophie David School of Medicine, now at the formal CUNY School of Medicine, does it make sense that the CUNY School of Medicine should centralize everything related to nursing program along the community college, senior college in all campus of CUNY? So with respect, council member, the discipline of medicine and the discipline of nursing are separate. Uh, we are collaborative partners in the healthcare setting. Uh, so the CUNY School of Medicine is focused on educating future physicians, while the CUNY schools of nursing, of which there are many, are focused on educating the future nurses that I get, will I, go into the healthcare world. Yeah. I get that point, sorry, for the purpose of time. It's no intention to cut you off. But where do we centralize? And since we have the former school of medicine, and I get, I used to be a teacher for 15 years, and I used to be a student when we're trying to preserve 
the city college school of nursing that unfortunately also was eliminated in the past. One of the challenges that we face about from where do we centralize all the program on nursing? And if we have a school of medicine at CUNY, does it make sense that that all program on nursing also should be centralized for the school, in that school? With respect, the CUNY School of Medicine focuses on the education of physicians. We have a centralized focus through the CUNY Office of the Dean of Health and Human Services, Dr. Patty Boyce, who testified here today. We also have a CUNY Nursing Discipline Council, which is comprised of the membership of all the deans, directors, and chairpersons of all the CUNY nursing programs. So okay, we do I, have a centralized and collaborative process for determining policy, for examining best practices, and for implementing program uh, changes and others. Okay. Is, there, is there a program of nursing at, 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 at the CUNY School of Medicine what used to be Sophie David? There is no school of nursing at the CUNY School of Medicine. Okay, H how much does it cost at CUNY to graduate a student of a, of, on, on, on the nursing program? I could not provide you with those numbers, but we're happy to have Dean Boyce collect all of the uh, requests for further information, and she will be happy to provide that to you. Okay, we do agree that those feel like right now, the, a student of the School of Engineering is double, it costs CUNY double one that from what a, a student as my major political science is today. Do you know that it costs more or, or you don't have any idea if it costs more for CUNY to graduate a student of a nursing program? I could not provide you with those numbers at this time, but we would be happy to identify that information and provide it through Dean Boyce uh, to Chair Barron and to yourself as to okay. the specific information you wish. Okay, which hospital are partners of the nursing program of CUNY? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, sir? Which, which hospitals uh, uh, does CUNY has as partner uh, which, for which, the nursing program? Which hospitals, is that the yeah. question? Uh, we have affiliation agreements with multiple facilities throughout New York City and New York State, including. Can, can you health. name? Can you name? Can you name this? A uh, few of those. All eleven health and hospitals facilities. Uh, we also have uh, alignments with New York Presbyterian, Mount Sinai, um, Amory. Amory. Do you have any others that you can yes, recall? We, we have affiliations with. Um, the Northwell system, which has a number of facilities on um, the Long Island Jewish, um, the Northwell Manhasset, Play Stream Franklin. We also have affiliations with NYU uh, Winthrop, and of course, uh, City Hospital, City Health and Hospital, Little Center, Elmhurst. Um, we have affiliations with Jamaica Hospital um, and um, with Flushing Hospital, and it many is of the nursing homes. Um, however, we have not been able to return to the nursing homes um, since March of last year. Okay. Is Harlan also part of the hospital oh. that is part yes, of the partnership? Yes, it is. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's a great program. And unfortunately, we saw some cut in the past. And I hope, again, my question of how much it costs is because I know that we have to do our part from the government, from the legislative mm -hmm. role to increase the funding, especially in the science and engineer that it costs more to CUNY to graduate a, a student in that field than a student who graduated in liberal art. But thank you for your job. Uh, thank you, Council Member Rodriguez for your questions. And to the panel, I just have a few more questions before uh, I'll move on to the next panel. So what is the status of, for those 200 students at Lehman, who are not able to sit for the exam and which I understand you are in fact appealing that decision and in that process. What's the financial impact on those students? If they had thought that they would be finished with their program in June, uh, do they now have to pay a tuition maintenance fee or do they have to enroll 
to maintain their status as a student? What's the impact on those 200 students financially in terms of coursework as well? It's my understanding, uh, Chair Barron, that the students can proceed to graduate uh, the certification exam is something um, that they take on conclusion of graduation. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the students would still be able to proceed with that. Uh, but I believe that Dean Boyce would probably have the best information for you in regard to the details. All right, then I do have a series of questions related to that, but we'll pose them to her uh, afterwards since she would be the person with the most accurate information on that. Because I also wanted to know, were there any indicators that Lehman's class uh, in 2019 was a little below the mark? Were there any indicators? And what's being done now to make sure that for this class, the next class that does sit for the exam, that they meet that minimum standard of 80%? Is that also questions that Dean Boyce would have the answer to? I think those are very good questions to ask, Chair Barron. Uh, again, not being privy to um, uh, the details, I believe that Dean Boyce would be the best one to be able to respond to those specifics. Okay. And then just for the record, I want to uh, put this question on, which probably will also be answered by Dean Boyce, and it regards LaGuardia Community College nursing students that had contacted my office previously about an ongoing issue that was first raised during the final term of my predecessor, my husband, who was then council member, Charles Barron. And students were concerned that their final grades in a course were in, while enrolled in a nursing program and we worked with them, but we never, we, the resolution was that they might have to retake the course. So I just want the question on the record so that I can have a response. What was the final outcome for those students? Did they take the SCR 290? And if not, were they reimbursed? Did those students graduate? And did they pass their Kaplan review class? And were they able to take their state board exam? So just to have those questions on the record to have them um, responded to. And now, I'm not familiar with those details, Chair Barron. So yeah. I believe that Dean Boyce would be the best one to be able to gather that information and respond to those questions. Um, I'll ask the host, are there any other council members who have questions? Uh, there are no other hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you so much. And that concludes the questions that I have for this panel. I wanna thank you for coming and for your testimony. And uh, you are dismissed. Thank you so much. And the host will call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much for your time. Thank you. thank you, Chair Barron and committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank you. Now that we have concluded CUNY's testimony, we will turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a, second, there's a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Giovanni Picant, Chair of the University Student Senate, Sumana Ali, Vice President for Academic and Legislative Affairs at the University Student Senate, J.D. Vasquez, a nursing student, and Amina Emanuel, also a nursing student. I will now call on Chair Picant. Time starts now. Good, good morning, uh, Chair Barron and the, the Committee on Higher Education. 
My name is Giovanni P. Quant, and I currently serve as the chairperson of University Student Senate and student trustee at CUNY. At the University Student Senate, we are the student body voice for all 500,000 students at the City University of New York, advocating for the progression and affordability of higher education. And today's over, I would like to give Chair Baron a thank you for holding an oversight hearing on nursing programs at CUNY. Being that we know just not, not nursing programs in general, but STEM degrees as a whole have taken a pivot and a change throughout the pandemic. Most of these courses are heavily involved with in-person interaction and on-campus learning. And these times have drastically changed for our students, which have affected their social and academic performance throughout CUNY. The impact on higher education during COVID-19 has greatly affected students throughout their mental health concerns, have created hardships through financial food and housing insecurity. A lack of support and advisement providing in STEM degrees across CUNY are greatly paramount to the issues that students face. And I heard from our administration, we kind of spoke about the statistics about diversity that we have at CUNY, but I do want to highlight the disparities that are still present, even in the field of STEM. A reporter from the city, Gabriel Sandoval, wrote an article last month discussing the CUNY STEM graduates. His findings found that STEM graduates nearly doubled in the last decade, but disparities still persist. This, a study collected from the Center of an Urban Future found that CUNY students were earning STEM degrees rose up to 9,013 degrees last year. But CUNY's Black and Hispanic students earned 31% of computer science degrees last year, while representing 55% of the student body. In the same year, 19% of computer science degrees were awarded to women, while women comprise 58% of the CUNY student population overall. Most underrepresented women were Hispanic and earned 7% 7, 7 of all STEM degrees and 4% of degrees in technology. Hispanic women make up 18% of the CUNY student body. And I think it's important for us to understand the lack of disparities. And as we segue to what the, the losing of the accreditation in the Masters of Family Nurse Practitioner at, at Lehman College, what we have heard from students is a lack of array of things that have also affect their academic journey and their pursuing of the nursing degree at Lehman College. Many students uh, advocated and spoke about the lack of culture affirmation and these strenuous and rigorous programs support and mental health concerns and also for financial and food insecurity that are heavily prevalent to our students that we face. Many students expressed that it was very hard to get through the semester and the lack of support for our students, such as mental health, is a huge factor, especially during these times when taking rig such rigorous courses and clinical hours throughout a virtual pandemic. The undergraduate ma master's in family nurse practitioner degree at Lehman College, I believe from my recollection, from my research, I'm, I'm... is the only degree program that CUNY has with this with this accreditation. And I think that the questions that Chair Barron asked in terms of the disparities and the racial disparities within the program, I think that it would be greatly helpful if we can receive that information because I have done my research and I couldn't find the disparities across in terms of the degrees that are awarded and also how are we supporting the students? I think a concept of centralized marketing and ensuring that students are supported and communication is going to be seamless and consistent and effective to our students is what we're also calling for. Additional funding for our nursing programs within CUNY and also support services to help students to sustain themselves throughout these programs are some of the demands that the University Student Senate has. And we look forward to working with the CUNY administration to provide a more holistic journey into the degrees of pursuing STEM at the City University of New York. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we will have Sumana Ali, Vice President of USS. Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, uh, City Council members. My name is Sumana Ali. I'm, a, I'm the Vice Chair of Legislative Affairs at CUNY uh, University Senate. And uh, I'm also a student government member at Lehman College. Thank you for holding this hearing on nursing programs at CUNY. Lehman College is one of the most diverse CUNY colleges, and it serves a diverse group of minority communities who play a vital role in this city every day. Approximately 56% of Lehman students are Hispanic, and 27% of Lehman students are African American. Additionally, 67% of our students are female. Majority of the Lehman students reside in the Bronx in communities that have been marginalized because of their race and socioeconomic status. COVID-19 and generational injustice have plagued our communities every day. 
in the middle of this dire and, uh, economic and public health crisis, CUNY students faced tuition hikes, loss of employment, and now loss of accredi uh, accreditation in our programs. According to the CUNY uh, Lehman statistics, nursing program is one of the most declared majors among undergraduate and graduate students. And Lehman produces passionate healthcare workers who support the city and are now needed in the city more than ever before. There is approximately one, uh, 220 students in the Lehman pro uh, nursing program and 44 of the, 44 of the uh, students are now set to complete the program in uh, December 2020 and graduate in 20, uh, 2021, January. In the in the late uh, in late no November last month, uh, Lehman College uh, announced that nursing students uh, will not be certified by the CCNE program, uh, the CCNE anymore, and. Um, it, it was decided that uh, the CCNE will withdraw their accredi accreditation of Lehman nursing, uh, nursing program, the FNP program, it's a master's program. And um, because of a mere technicality, now 44 FNP program who are ready to graduate will not be allowed to take their certification exam. This may look like a small number. However, these students in the FNP program completed over 500 hours of clinical time with direct patient care. And many of these students are also working full time while meeting these rigorous requirements. Family nurse pr practitioners can see patients of all ages, diagnose illnesses and pres even prescribe medication. They must get a chance to take their certification exam at at the end of this year, they're, um, they're graduating during a pandemic where the city needs more healthcare workers, but they can practice with their degrees uh, as of now. At the, at the least, the Commission uh, on Collegiate Nursing I'm Education sorry. should allow these students to sit on their certification exam. The students in Lehman are only asking for a chance to sit, sit in the exam and serve the city. Our students now need uh, the city's support and uh, because of what's happening in our nursing program, uh, and I, I believe this is a great injustice to minority students. Um, after countless barriers, the students uh, finish their program requirements and they're now, and they don't even have the chance to now sit in their exam. They, uh, they need their college administrators and rep elected representatives to deliver a result by the end of this month. And, uh, it is simply unacceptable that even one FNP student at Lehman is denied the right to sit for this exam, let alone 44. This is the time for action. And uh, if you do say that you care about healthcare workers and minority students, this is the time to prove that you do care about their time and you care about uh, the money and the in, uh, investment they've made in uh, CD, uh, CUNY. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Unfortunately, uh, both JD Vasquez and Amina Emanuel uh, logged out of the Zoom meeting. And so we are next going to call up Ann Bove and Marina Amanova. Uh, Ann Bove, Assistant Professor of Nursing at BMCC. Uh, you, may you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Okay, my name is Ann Bove. I am actually a product of CUNY times three, generic as well as two masters. I'm also uh, retired from Bellevue Hospital after 40 years of service and currently am BMCC faculty. I'm here as a member of the board of directors from NISA and I, I submitted a very detailed um, death testimony with regards to what I'm gonna say, so I'm gonna cut to the chase. Basically, nursing education and training moved from schools of nursing to the academic setting in the late 60s, early 70s. When that transition happened, training was at a loss. And through the years, in terms of um, complementing the needing for training, the hospital settings have picked it up. Who has picked it up in the city of New York primarily is New York City Health and Hospitals. And it takes about... Um, three months to orient the average new graduate upon arrival to the hospital setting, which ends up being in today's world about $30,000 that the hospitals are picking up. Subsequent to that, we also don't have the resources in terms of staff education accordingly. So um, 
the new graduate is coming in and looking for jobs where the private sector actually directs that new graduate, and it's been my witness to the fact, to the public sector for training accordingly. Subsequently, what I would like, not just myself, but what many of us who came from the hospital-based training framework is a better bridge between academia and the hospital setting as seen by something known as the Vermont Nurse Internship Program. Also, in terms of what was holding up transition into, you know, going back to the clinical setting was the idea of face mask fit testing. And that's where coordination from a centralized framework is, to me, vitally important so that you would have face mask fit testing for the N95 and subsequently be done by the schools so that would be a quick transition into that clinical setting accordingly. And also in terms of supplementing the educational process that needs to be done for training in the hospitals by getting access to graduate medical education money as the medical schools have as well. So this has been a problem prior to COVID and it's been totally exp exponentially increased as a result of COVID. Thank you for this time for testimony. Thank you for testifying. Next, we have Ms. Aminova. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak today about the events circling my school. My name is Marina Aminova. I am one of the 45 students at Lehman College's Graduate Family Nurse Practitioner Program, scheduled to graduate in just two weeks. I graduated at Delphi University in 2009 and received my bachelor's degree in nursing. I have worked as a registered nurse in both the community and the hospital. During this time, I also started a family like many of my other fellow colleagues did as well. I entered Lehman College in the summer of 2018 with a dream of becoming a family nurse practitioner. Many of my fellow graduate students started at the same time as I did and some even before me. Many took out student loans and others used their life savings to pursue our degree. Even though we all came from different walks of life, we all became friends. We shared our struggles and supported each other when it was hard to juggle family life, working full time, attending school, and at the same time studying hard. This year hit us strong, all of us equally. The coronavirus pandemic was nothing like we had ever expected or imagined. Everywhere we turned, patients were dying on our units. Nurses were needed to work overtime. We were scared, we were exhausted, and we were vulnerable. However, it did not deter us. We knew our path in life as nurses. There is no other profession like it. We lost family members. We experienced dark moments. All the while, we were still attending school and still completing hundreds upon hundreds of clinical hours needed to graduate in the most impoverished county in this state during the worst pandemic in the century. Our December graduation was our only light at the end of a very lo long, dark tunnel. On November 20th, our dreams became a living nightmare. We were informed by Lehman that our, we have lost accreditation mere weeks prior to our graduation. We do not know the details about what happened and we were only made aware by chance when our fellow students in May cohort began to apply for their boards only to be rejected over the summer due to loss of accreditation in June. Frazzled and confused, we began to email our department heads. We were told everything will be okay and continue to keep studying hard as the school secured an appeals hearing in November and were confident it was going to go in their favor. But on November 20th, we faced the horrifying reality that these last years, years of hard work, sacrifice, time away from spouses, parents, and our children, time away from work, foregone income, paid tuition, tireless studying, has all been for nothing. The fact that this matter resonates beyond the student body and our families is evidenced by the media attention this matter has generated and the significant number of signatures our online petition has accrued. Our communities are just as devastated and, effect and affected by this horrific news. It is as much of a loss to them as it is to us. We learned so far that in 2017, CCNE made Lehman aware of a standard that was not met to keep accreditation. By 2019, Lehman had put policies in place to meet the required standard. The 2019 cohort short showed proof that these policies were working. And the 2020 cohort sh would show the same. However, despite the law passed in uh, July to allow and encourage accrediting bodies to allow more time for programs to come up to par, CCNE still withdrew their accreditation. We were notified by the Dean that a letter was sent out to CCNE requesting to postpone the 20th, November 20th accreditation to February so that we can finish a school that was CCNE uh, approved. 
they are holding a meeting today of the Board of Commissioners at CCNE. However, we were notified by the Dean that CCNE has every right to deny our request. I'd also like to point out that while graduating in New York State, we have a valid degree. Graduating without CCNE accreditation is not an option. We are not allowed to bill Medicare and Medicaid. Nobody will hire us without being board certified. And the only thing we will have is just a valid degree hanging on our walls. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And as it seems that we only have one more person logged in to testify, uh, we will go to that person. In the meantime, if I have inadvertently missed anyone, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. So next we will have Sinai CEO. You may begin when the Sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Uh, Sinai CEO, are you uh, present? There's, there should be a window popping up on your computer asking you to unmute yourself. Unfortunately, uh, we will move on. And Sinai, if you uh, come back, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will turn to Chair Barron for questions. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. You're doing a great job juggling and getting everyone on. I wanna thank this panel because this is a panel and I'm also appreciative to the fact that the CUNY uh, personnel are still here to be able to hear personally what your testimony has been talking about first the underrepresentation of the black and brown communities. We're glad to hear that uh, CUNY exceeds what is nationally the standard and statewide the standard, that's good news. And I think we're looking to the broad field of science, technology and math and the underrepresentation in that part. But certainly as we've heard um, from Ms. Ali, about the percentages, I think she cited 56% Latin and 27% African American, and talked about all of the hikes, intuition, and the stress, and all that uh, has been endured by these students that are working so hard. And certainly, um, Miss Aminova, Aminova, I'm not sure if I got the name pro properly brought it home because she is directly impacted by that. So I do have a couple of questions as well. Um, uh, Ms. Anne Bove, Bove, or Bove, I'm not sure of the correct pronunciation, please give it to me. You talked about the Vermont Nurse Intern Program. If you could speak a little about that, uh, I'd like information on that. That is a program that was established maybe 20 years ago. And what Vermont did as a small state was it took, um, it took the state education department as well as the schools in terms of faculty and students, as well as the clinical setting in terms of the healthcare agencies with administration, clinical educators, and then staff to put together how to make a seamless transition from the academic setting to the clinical setting. As I mentioned to you, it takes about three months for an average orientation for med surge. And since now, um, what's considered nursing education and training is in the academic setting, funding does not go to the hospital anymore to provide the appropriate accoutrements and staffing for that training. So, um, so what this group did is they developed a seamless transitional preceptor type of uh, presentation. And New York City Health and Hospitals about maybe 15 years ago, you know, looked at that and instituted a preceptor program accordingly. But once again, funding is an issue because you have to provide staff. And when you're developing a preceptor program, 
that orientee is not counted in the numbers as a direct care provider. So basically that's where the 30,000 comes as well as the added professional development um, through instructors by staff development that needs to be. So in current cost, you're looking at 30,000, but, but, but by developing this transitional process, they were able to, to cut costs accordingly. Um, but I do think that there has to be not just myself, but my colleagues from the professional development, staff development framework from which I come before I was on faculty, believe that there needs to be a stronger transitional process and a, tr a stronger link, a stronger bridge between um, the academic setting and HHC or H and H as we know it now. And um, you know, the the best link is is CUNY to H and H, and um, and it would also transition more people into uh, more nurses into the positions that are so sorely needed. And just as a subjective framework, you know, I, I've been subjected to you know nurse young nurses coming to me saying, um, you know, that hospitals have actually told them go get your two years or year in a city hospital and then come back and will hire you in terms of the private sector. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I truly believe H and H is the foundation for healthcare in New York city. And I do believe that CUNY is the foundation for education in New York city as well. And, um, and I just think that we need to be able to bring those two together more collaboratively in terms of this training and educational process accordingly so that we can deal with this shortage um, as, as, as needed. And um, there's graduate medical education money that's out there for hospital-based training that the medical schools all claim. But since now nursing schools are not, nursing programs are not considered hospital-based, they're not you know, allocated, the hospitals aren't allocated at those funds when in reality they are still doing the training. Thank you. Okay, so this is another, a new aspect for me to, and I'm trying to get a better understanding. So as a person in the field of education, you take your education classes, you get your placement, you get your student teaching, you get your degree, you pass the exam and you're licensed to teach. When you get to the school where you are, you may be assigned a buddy teacher who will help you know, help you navigate the processes. But are you saying that when these graduates come to you after completing all of those preliminary work that there's a specific three month period? Yes. They, they, yes, they cannot take a full patient assignment. So they can't be, it's, it's not like the, um, you know, I wasn't in that. I was in, I went to Hunter. I graduated now 19, I'll tell you, 1978. So um, I did supplementary um, practice on weekends. Like they had programs where you could supplement your training. But one, if a new graduate goes through a nursing program, there, there's somebody by the name of Patricia Benner. And she recognized the concept of novice to expert. And, um, and when they come out as novices, you know, as a new graduate, they're not skilled to take care of the full role of a registered nurse at that time. Okay. And that's what orientation is all about. You know, their clinical experience is one to two patients. And even if we get nurse patient ratios passed in New York State, they're not, they're not able to, and much more limited now in terms of coming out and taking that full patient assignment. Okay, that's new information to me and that's helpful. And you say that that process costs the hospital about $30,000? That that's including salary and benefits and, um, and also the salaries of those people in staff development that are bringing along this orientation process. Okay, thank you, that's helpful to know. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Aminova, and please give me the correct pronunciation. What is the status now? What, what can you expect as a part of that uh, group of people who were denied the opportunity to even sit for the exam? 
what is your status? What is your expectation? What are your plans? What can be done to bring pressure to bear? What kinds of alternative uh, platforms or systems can be used from your perspective? Well, truth be told, we don't really know what options we have. We are being told that we can go ahead and graduate and receive our degree. However, when we spoke with CCNE, they told us that if you if you do that and Lehman one day in the future receives accreditation again, we will be ex excluded um, from sitting for the boards. So if we decide to choose that route, there's really not much we can do. And there's only three states in this country where you are legally allowed to practice. That's New York, California, and um, I believe uh, Arkansas. Um, but regardless, in New York, we cannot bill. Um, most, if not all, hospitals and, and companies want you to be board certified within a year. Uh, so really, that's not an option. And when we asked uh, the school what routes are they taking, um, it's really just letters that they have told us that they sent out for now. They sent out a letter to CCNE asking for an extension, a good cause extension till February. Um, and they also sent out a letter to AANP, which is the second uh, testing body, um, to show them that we are, NYSED uh, is nationally accredited, which in fact, they showed us a letter that they received from the US Department of Education mm -hmm. stating that NYSED is nationally recognized as a school, as a, as a accrediting body, um, as an accredited body. However, NYSED is not a accrediting body, which means they can't go ahead and accredit at schools outside of New York. They are strictly regional. Um, so I'm not really sure what they're arguing with AANP. Um, honestly, we don't really know what other choices we have. And that's what we're trying to figure out because time is of the essence for us. We are literally 15 days away. We don't know if we should postpone graduation. Is there, is there a point to postpone? Um, if we postpone in six months, people have student loans that they need to begin to pay. Um, you know, we spent this money on this degree and now we won't have the income to recoup what we invested. We don't really know where we stand. And, and that's why we're trying to reach out to anybody that will listen. We reached out to CCNE, we reached out to ANCC, to AANP, to NYSNA, to ANA. I mean, whoever you can think of, we reached out to them for help because we don't know what to do at this point. Okay. Um, is, is, uh, is Lehman the only school that offers this uh, Masters in NFP? The only CUNY school, yes. The only CUNY school, yes. Yes. The only CUNY school that does that. Because I was wondering, since we have pathways and since we have this transfer uh, system within CUNY as a university-wide system, might there be some way to transfer it to another institution, campus? But if you're the only one, then that's apparently not something that that could happen. Well, uh, we also asked the school if they can help us transfer to any school in New York State, even a SUNY school. There's two SUNY schools that that have it. Okay, uh, which two of those? Transfer, uh, Downstate and Stony Brook. Oh. And, and we were told that if you want to transfer, that is your decision. We will not help you in that. That is what our Dean of Nursing said. So we are on our own with that. And when we looked into SUNY schools and any other private school uh, for that matter, the maximum transfer credits they are willing to take is nine credits. Mm. Mm. So that's not an option either. We'd be starting all over. I, I would think that, you know, with a SUNY school, had there been one, I would think that that might've been a path that we might pursue. But I think you could understand that another institution outside of CUNY might be reluctant to take someone that they haven't had any affiliation with based on the fact that they're coming from a school that has lost their accreditation. I could understand why they would be hesitant to say, oh, okay, come on and 
we'll make any kind of transfer arrangement so that you can sit because I think they might be fearful that that might negatively impact their results. So Absolutely, and that's what we thought as well. And all the more reason, and we were told by ANCC, which is the testing body, um, that Lehman can secure a deal with CCNE to have a good cause extension. And, and vice versa, we, when we spoke to CCNE associate director, um, they told us that Lehman can secure a deal with ANCC to allow us to be grandfathered in and make an exception for us. And it seems like the examination body and the accrediting body are pointing fingers at each other. Um, and Lehman is in the center that has to secure deals. And I don't know what kind of deals they are securing past the letter that they sent. And what would, do you know what this good cause extension would do? It would, it would postpone the November 20th withdrawal to February 21st. Okay. That's the good cause. I see. For the sake of our cohort to be- to That be, cohort could then take the exam. Yes, and yeah. we can graduate from an accredited school. And higher education, if we wanted to pursue other routes, like we were thinking, maybe we can pursue our DNP. Maybe we can get a post-master's degree. All of those schools that we looked into, both state schools, private schools, and online schools, all require you to have a master's degree from a CCNE accredited school. Mm -hmm. So we can't even pursue higher education. The prerequisite for all the other ideas that you're talking about. Okay. Um, well, we've got to think deep. As you say, the clock is ticking, the sands are running through the hourglass and I'm sure that we can put our heads together. I perhaps need to perhaps need to reach out to um, assembly members and state senators in their capacity as state legislators to add their voices to this issue, which as you have indicated is fairly recent in coming to our attention, but we need to put our heads together and uh, come up with something. So I would like to offer some time on Monday for us to brainstorm or whoever's taking the lead on this, how we can be supportive in raising the critical nature of this situation, particularly in this time of COVID uh, and get some, some resolution that resolves this, that brings us a resolution that benefits the students that have, as you've so adequately talked about, invested so much so much into getting there, getting to this point. But I just want to thank the panel uh, for their for their testimony. And again, my office, I'm ready to give whatever assistance I can to get the resolution to this. Yeah. Uh, um, can I ask you how I can follow up with either you or anybody else in regards to what kind of um, decisions and, and, and discussions will take place in the upcoming weeks? Uh, yes, you can reach out to my uh, staff and you can reach out to the CUNY staff. Uh, or my staff, you can, um, you can text M. Washington, not text, email, I'm sorry, M. Washington at council.nyc.gov. And perhaps uh, Ms. Rivera will be able to offer another contact with the city council. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it back now to the moderator, Ms. Rivera. Thank you, Chair Barron. I would just like to make one more call for Sanai CEO. Um, a member of our staff is trying to unmute you. If you can accept and uh, present your testimony. All right, seeing that uh, Sanai CEO is unresponsive, I'm going to ask if any council members have any questions at this time for this panel. Not seeing any council members logged in. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that 
If they would like to submit written testimony, they may do so within 72 hours of this hearing date by emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. And, um, and we have now concluded this hearing. Chair Barron. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, I declare that this hearing is adjourned. And thank you so much to all the staff that work so diligently behind the scenes making this hearing possible. Thank you. Thank you.